right. On page 166, we are picking up with the rational zero test. Rational zero test. All right. You might remember that last week in the first part of section 2-3, we were talking about ways that we could factor things that we didn't know how to factor before this. Uh, for instance, if we had a cubic and it didn't have a greatest common factor and you couldn't factor it by grouping, um, if they gave me something to factor it by, then we were able to go through and either do polynomial long division or if it was in the X minus K form, we were able to do synthetic division and then once we divided it, then that gave us a way of factoring that down. What we want to pick up today is what if they don't give me the way to start? What if they don't give me that first factor? I could find that for myself using the rational zero test on page 166. So here's what it says. If you have a polynomial that has integer coefficients, all right, integers, positive and negative whole numbers, right? So you can't have fractions, you can't have decimals, you can't have imaginaries. You have to have coefficients that are positive and negative whole numbers. So in our example, we do. It also says that if you have a rational zero of the function, all right, rational, if it's rational, it can be written as a fraction or a decimal or a whole number, or, but it can't be irrational, which is non-repeating, non-terminating, like square root of 5 or something like that. It also cannot be imaginary, so of course like 2i. So if you have a rational answer like 1 half or negative 2 thirds or negative 3, this would be a way to find that. But if you have an irrational answer or an imaginary answer, this is not going to help you, okay? So if you have integer coefficients and you have rational zeros of the function, you can find them by finding all of the factors of your constant, we're going to call that P, and all of the factors of your leading coefficient, we're going to call that Q, and then we'll put the P's over the Q's. Now, something that will make this a lot easier is I want to be sure that I factor out any common factors that I have before I do my P over Q. One, it just gives me fewer numbers to work with, but it also would eliminate answers that are not possibilities. So if we come down and we look at our cubic, I don't have any common factors that I can take out of that, so nothing that I need to start with there. So let's go through and say, all right, all the factors of P, P is 3, so you could have a positive 1 times a positive 3, but you could also have a negative 1 times a negative 3, right? So let's just say plus or minus 1 plus or minus 3. And then the factors of Q. Q is our leading coefficient. That's 2. So what are the factors of 2 going to give me? Yes, plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2, because it could be positive 1 times positive 2 or negative 1 times negative 2. So if we put every possible combination of P over Q, then we could say that would be 1 over 1 and 1 over 2. It could also be 3 over 1 and 3 over 2. So that's going to give us plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 1 half, plus or minus 3 halves. I had eight possibilities there. Are all eight of those going to be solutions? No. How do you know? They might be. How do you know? <laughs> yeah, it's only got a degree of three. It can't have eight solutions if it only has a degree of three. So again, what this rational zero test tells me is if you have rational roots, they're going to be in this list. Now, not all eight of those are going to be solutions, but if there is a solution to my problem that's a rational number, it's sitting there in that list, okay? So now I just have to go through and try them, all eight of them, until I find one that works. So we want a fast, easy way of trying this. Now, when we say try it, we're saying, okay, if let's say positive 1. If positive 1 were a solution, it were a root to this problem, then if I wrote that in its factor form, x minus 1, if I divided this cubic right here by x minus 1, then it would divide with a remainder of 0. Well, we had a much faster way of figuring that out other than doing the whole long division thing, right? We had synthetic division, 
If it was in that X minus K form, which it is, we even had a faster, easier way. That was the remainder in the factor theorem, right? The remainder theorem said, if you just want to know the remainder, which we do, you could take your number, like positive one that we were just discussing, and plug it into the function. So if we go through and we put one in the place of X, that'd be two times one cubed plus three times one squared minus eight times one plus three. That's gonna give me zero. That was my remainder theorem. It said, if you plug one into the function, the answer that you get will be the remainder. The factor theorem said if you get a remainder of zero, that means that what you were dividing by was a factor. Root, solution, x-intercept, zero of the function. So that gives me a fast, easy way that I can go through these eight possibilities and test them until I find one that works. It was nice that the very first one that we tried worked, so let's go with that one. All right, as soon as I figure out that one is a solution, that means that if I divided this cubic by x minus 1, because remember it's x minus k, k is what I put into the function, or k is what I can put in my little box for synthetic division. So as soon as I plugged in 1 and it worked, that lets me know that I can divide this cubic by x minus k. So let's do that. I would much rather do synthetic division than polynomial long division, so that's the route I'm going to go here. So remember for your synthetic division, you bring your first number straight down. Of course, these are our coefficients across the top here, the two, three, negative eight, three. So bring that first term straight down. We're gonna multiply two times one and put that answer in the second column. Three and two is five. Multiply the five times one and put that answer in the next column, combine. Negative three times one, put that answer in the next column, combine. And because we had x to the third, and it was being divided by x to the first, then I know this first answer right here is going to start with x to the second. So we would have x to the second, x to the first, no x, and my remainder. Or you could start the opposite way and say, if this is my remainder, this is my constant term, x to the first, x to the second. So we kept using that analogy over and over again about if you're dividing 30 by 5, when you divide 30 by 5, you get a remainder of 0. So that means that it is a factor. And when you divide 30 by 5, the answer that you get 6 is your other factor. So it's the same idea here. When I took that cubic and I divided it by x minus 1 and I got a remainder of 0, that meant it was a factor. And the answer that I got when I divided it was my other factor. So that is the same thing that we did in the first half of this lesson where they would give me a cubic and we would divide it by one factor to get the other factor, but they did not give me that factor this time. We found it for ourselves. So now we're completely independent that we can take the polynomial from the very beginning and we can find that first factor for ourselves to then go ahead and divide to break it down. So now what we're left with is just a quadratic, and we're good once we get to a quadratic, right? Because we could factor, and if it won't factor, then we could use quadratic formula. This one does factor, so we can go ahead and break that down. We're looking for what multiplies to be negative three and adds to be positive five. And then we can set each of our factors equal to zero to find our solutions. Now it just so happened that all three of the solutions that we got for this problem were rational solutions. That, of course, isn't always the case. But in this case, they were all rational. And if you'll notice, every single one of those, positive 1, positive 1 half, and negative 3, they were all up here in my list, right? There's the positive 1, there's the positive 1 half, and there's the negative 3. Okay, well then, I'm not going to bother doing all of this stuff. I would be a whole lot faster and easier if I just plugged these numbers into the function and as soon as I found the three that worked then I'd have my three answers and I wouldn't have to do all that other stuff. True if all of your answers are rational. But if your answers aren't rational, you can sit here all day long and plug in as many numbers as you want to and you're not going to find imaginary solutions and irrational solutions. And we all know that when you solve a quadratic like this guy that we had here, 
we could have just as easily come up with irrational solutions or imaginary solutions, and then it wouldn't have done me any good to be sitting here continually plugging in values. It won't find those. It'll only find the rational ones. All right, so let's look at another one of those. Oh, uh, one thing I've mentioned to you, they'll typically ask me to find like the real solutions and then to give all solutions. The reasoning behind that, I know that seems kind of repetitive on this example because it's the same thing, but it wouldn't always be the same thing. Uh, if I had imaginary solutions, I might only have one real solution sitting here, and then I would have three solutions down here in total. What they're trying to again reinforce to you is that you may only have one x-intercept for a cubic. That doesn't mean that you don't have three solutions to it. It just means you have one real solution and two imaginaries that aren't showing up on your graph kind of thing. And so they're reinforcing that same thing to you here, that you really are getting three solutions when you're solving this. All right, so let's look at another one. X to the fourth plus X squared minus two. All right, so P is going to be the factors of our constant. So what are the factors of our constant? Plus or minus one and plus or minus two. Constant is negative two. So plus or minus one and plus or minus two. All right, then Q is going to be the factors of our leading coefficient. What's our leading coefficient? One. So we would only get plus or minus one, right? So let's put all of our P's over our Q's, and we'll get plus or minus one and plus or minus two. Oh, this is an easy one because there are four solutions over here, and this is a degree of four, so there's my four answers right there. Okay, let's try that. Let's say that I tried, last time I started by plugging in positive 1, this time I'll start by plugging in positive 2. So I start by plugging in positive 2. Uh, yeah, that didn't work. So I plugged in positive 2. That is not a solution. I did not get 0 as a remainder, so that means that this is not a factor. All right, so we plugged in positive 2. It did not work, not a factor, so let's try something else. I could have tried positive 1, negative 1, negative 2. I'm going to try positive 1. gives me a remainder of 0. So yes, it is a factor. So as soon as I find something that's a factor, then I want to start trying to break down that quartic with either polynomial long division or synthetic division. I prefer synthetic, so I'm going to go that route. So again, remember, this is my k value. That's what goes in my little box over here. So even though in factor form it's x minus 1, the solution form or the, val the k value is positive 1. Also remember that when you're doing uh, polynomial long division or synthetic division and you skip terms, you must put in zero placeholders. So we had 1x to the fourth, 0x to the third, 1x squared, 0x, negative 2. All right, so when you finish with your synthetic division, what's this first term up here going to be? X to the what? Third, right, because we had X to the fourth being divided by X, so that's going to be X to the third. So here's what I know. I had a quartic. I found out that X minus 1 was one of the factors because that's X minus K, where K is 1, that we plugged in here, we plugged in here. So I know X minus 1 is one of the factors. <coughs> And when I divided that quartic by x minus 1, the answer that I got would be my other factor. So that cubic is my other factor. Now, unlike in the last problem, when I got here, I had a quadratic that I could just factor. I have a cubic here. I can't solve that like I do a quadratic. So in that case, I'm going to... So we need to start all over again. We've got this quartic that we broke down to a linear times a cubic. I've got to break down this cubic. So I'm going to act as if that was the original problem that they gave me. This is like a problem in a problem. Start all over again, analyzing that cubic with your P's and your Q's. So I could go through and I could say, okay, let's think about this cubic. My P values would be plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2. And my Q values would be plus or minus 1. So if I put my P's over my Q's, I'm going to get plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2. Now, 
That will not always be the case that I get the same possible rational roots here as I had up here. They may have differences, they may have similarities. Something that will save me a little bit of time. Because this cubic is a factor of this cortic, if something wasn't a factor of that cortic, it's not gonna be a factor of that cubic either. So if I've already tried values up here, like if I tried positive two up here and it didn't work, there's no need, even though it's in my list right here, there's no need to try positive two again. <laughs> it's still not gonna work. The converse of that is not true though. If you try positive one and it worked, that doesn't mean that you can't use it again. Because remember that idea of double roots and triple roots, you can get the same answer more than once. So don't automatically rule something out if you're like, oh, I tried that already, it already worked, I'm done with that one, don't try that one again. You definitely can try it again. It won't always work, but it might, so it's worth a try. So for this one, if I have possibilities of plus or minus one and plus or minus two, I know positive two is out. So I'm gonna start with positive one. So if I go through and plug in positive one, I do not get a remainder of zero, so it is not a solution a second time. So let's try a different one, let's try negative one. And if I plug negative one in, it does work. If I had plugged negative one in up here in the original cortic, it would have worked up there as well. So if I plug negative one in, that's going to be something that I can use to factor my cubic, right? All right, so let's do synthetic division. So this is my k value of negative one. That's the same number that goes in my box for my negative one. We're trying to break down the cubic. So don't go back to your cortic up here. Remember, we started all over again like this was a brand new problem. So my coefficients are one, one, two, two. So that's what you'll see right across here. So we do our synthetic division. And if we took that cubic and we divide it by x, then we would end up with a quadratic. So here's the progress that we had already made. We had already said this quartic is this linear times this cubic. So we just copy that down here. Now we've just broken down that cubic because we found out that negative one, when we plugged it in, negative one gave us a remainder of zero. So if we write that in its factor form, that would be x plus one, x minus k, k would be a negative one, that's right there. This is its factor form. And when we divided that cubic by x plus one, the answer that we got, x squared plus two, that's our other factor. So now we've got it down to a quadratic. And so now we could finish solving Factoring quadratic formula, in this case, it's very easy just to move the two to the other side and then take the square root of both sides. So there are our four solutions. One, two, three, four, because we have plus and minus there. There are our four solutions. What are my real solutions? One and negative one, right. And then we could list all of them to, again, reinforce that idea that if this is a degree of four, I should be getting four solutions. Now, this is the longest, hardest, most laborious way to factor. If there is any other way that you have ever learned in all of your life to factor, it would be faster and easier than this. So before you start a problem and you just automatically jump in to do in P and Q, look and see is there any other way that I have learned how to do this. Back in August, we learned how to factor something that was in this form, x to the fourth plus x squared minus two. We called that a quartic that was in quadratic form. And the reason that we called it that was we said if this term squared if this term were squared, it would give me this term, and this is a constant. That's the same idea as a quadratic. So we could look at that and we could say, okay, x to the fourth would factor to be x squared times x squared, and what multiplies to be negative two and adds to be positive one would be positive two and negative one, and I could factor it in that way. We also said that if that was hard for you to see, like you're looking at that and going, I still don't see how that's a quadratic. We said what you could do is substitute it out like replace that middle term with something else like a y. So if I replace x squared with y, then this would be y squared 
and this would be negative 2, then it's easier to see, okay, y squared is y times y, and what multiplies to be negative 2 and adds to be positive 1 would be positive 2 and negative 1. Once I substitute it out like that and get it factored, then I can just go back and say, okay, now let me put my x squared back in place of my y, and that would give me the x squared plus 2 and the x squared minus 1. So once I have it factored, set each of those factors equal to 0. So we could say, okay, uh, x squared is equal to negative 2 and x squared is equal to positive 1. Take the square root of both sides, don't forget to put in your plus or minus, and you'll get plus or minus the square root of negative 2, which is plus or minus the square root of 2i. And then over here, x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1, which is plus or minus 1. That's the same four answers that we got up here. And we did it in one, two, three, four, five lines, as opposed to a whole page of work, right? Maybe you didn't catch that when you first started the problem. And so you went ahead and you did that first step where you took that cortic and you found a factor and you broke it down to a cubic. Then when you get right here to where you have that cubic written as a linear uh, I'm sorry, that quartic written as a linear times a cubic. Before you start all over again with doing P's and Q's, look at that cubic and see, is there any other way on the face of the earth that I know how to factor that thing? Because I would rather go that way than what I'm about to do with P's and Q's again. And sure enough, that one will factor by grouping, right? If I group the first two terms and I group the last two terms, I could take out the greatest common factor of X squared, and that would leave me with X plus 1 take out the greatest common factor of 2, and that would leave me with x plus 1. So since I got the same thing here and here, pull out that x plus 1. It's kind of like put your finger over this and put your finger over this, and what you have left, that x squared plus 2 is your other factor. Set each of those factors equal to 0, you'll get x equals negative 1 here. Move the 2 to the other side and take the square root, don't forget your plus or minus, and you'll get plus or minus the square root of 2i. So we would have already had that first factor, x minus 1, so we would have gotten the x equals 1 from that. And then this would have been a much faster, easier way to break down that cubic to get those other three answers. That would still have given me my four solutions, and I wouldn't have had to go back through that p over q thing a second time. So they intentionally gave us a problem that we knew how to work other ways so that we could see, hey, the answers that we're coming up with really are true. And if there's another way to do this, it's most definitely going to be faster and easier than this. I want to use this as a last resort, but it is great to have it as a way to break down something that otherwise I have no way of breaking down. Okay. All right, one last thing that they mentioned to me is that we always want to be sure that we take out the greatest common factor. Like I look at an example like this and I'm like, great, x to the fifth, how many times am I going to have to do p over q on this one? Well, if I'll go through, sometimes I can take out a greatest common factor of x or x squared or maybe even x cubed, and then I break it down to something much easier to work with. In this case, if I took out that greatest common factor of x, what I'm left with is that other problem that we were just doing a second ago. So that would be another way that they could have asked me that problem. In that case, it would have had one additional solution. We would have had the um, x is equal to 0 and then those same four solutions that we had previously gotten. So that was the only thing that they wanted to caution me about there, was just to be careful to take out a greatest common factor and any solutions that might go along with it. All right, so here is our homework for tonight on page 171. We're doing 45, 51, 55, 57, 59, 63, 65, challenge 68.